together for shelter praise glory to Jesus anybody just encouraged by those testimonies this morning you see like I would always say the law of familiarity makes something that happened around you not to be as significant as the one that happened somewhere else. That's how familiarity works. It's an evil law because familiarity can make you ignore what you should have noticed. The prophet asked the woman, he said, what do you have? He said, nothing. Except a little pot of oil. That thing that she was ignoring was our salvation because the prophet didn't bring anything from anywhere but she became familiar with the oil so she defined it as nothing that's the problem with familiarity and one of the problems that will birth is not enough gratitude because if you don't recognize it you won't appreciate it Where is that mama from Abuja? Where, where, is, where, where is she? Huh? She's gone. She traveled back. She came to give her testimony. You see, that woman, from my information, she's a health worker. That makes her testimony more significant. It's not like some ignorant person. From my information, she works at the, at the, at the Aso Rock Clinic. And then that affliction came upon her. She saw all the doctors at the Asoro Clinic. I'm sure you know about the Asoro Clinic. Well, in case you don't know, let me inform you. We just invested 20 billion naira on that clinic as a nation. 20 billion. One clinic. So it's a 20 billion naira clinic. It's more expensive than the whole of BSU teaching hospital. <laughs> Plus Federal Medical Center. She's from that hospital. The affliction came on her. And for four months, she didn't sleep once, day or night day or night. The doctors there did everything. 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 Until her sister told her, come to Makodi. Let my pastor pray for you. On a Sunday morning like this, she traveled. She missed the service. Tuesday or Monday or so, we had an appointment. They came to the office. Immediately, God delivered her. The team left. Immediately. And when the thing left, I just told her, go home and sleep. That's the instruction. She left here, they went home. While she was just sitting down in the sitting room, she started sleeping. She didn't wake up again until the next day. They had to, the only time she woke up after they left here was when they woke her from the sitting room to move to the bedroom. She just went and continued like that till the next day after not sleeping for four consecutive months. That by itself is a sickness. 
different from what was wrong, what caused it. Child of God, that was a creative miracle. God intervened instantly. If you are not careful, because it's happening in your church, you think it's not miracle enough. If you had watched it on television, you'd be jumping like this. Hey, 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 see God, see God. That's the law of familiarity. It's dangerous. It makes you not to be grateful to God enough. Let's be careful. That's what makes men not to see that their wife is finer than the other girl outside. The law of familiarity. You will not notice that your husband is the best man. You'll be looking at another person's husband, same man, same man. Wait until you get that man. Then you'll know that familiarity dealt with you. Familiarity will make you look for something that is not missing somewhere. And when you are looking for something that is not missing, you will never find it. Because you don't know what you are looking for. Somebody that us are nearly killed went to him on Saturday morning and handled that boom. <laughs> and no pain. If there was pain, he would not be standing here this morning testifying. Now, you may not understand. The implication of the accurization is this. He's a fermenter. So, Aku was the wrong choice. He had to have been healed to eat Aku, and 24 hours later, he's still standing without symptoms. Your God is working. Lift your hands and give him praise. Be intentional now that I've brought you back to yourself. Be intentional. Give God thanks like you know he's the one that is working. Give him thanks like you are aware, like you are conscious that your God is at work and he is the mighty God. He is a glorious God. He is the everlasting arm upon whom we lean, upon which we lean. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We return all the glory to you. We return all the praises to you. Hey, my mama coffee latte. My calibrado zendelebre. My sofre de manaya covenus. Rato saquatele. Thank you for so great a salvation. Thank you for mighty deliverances, healings. Thank you for. Mega breakthroughs, turning the stories of men around up on this mountain. Thank you for transformation of lives. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration. Oh, my name, Shaya. Brato Zizizalabra. We give you praise. Yahweh, we give you glory. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything you are doing up on this mountain. Thank you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. Take all the glory. Take all the honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, our God be glorified for everything you are doing amongst us. Even when we act like we are not aware, Lord, we recognize your hand. Thank you for your mighty visitation upon this mountain. To you be all the glory and the praise forever. In Jesus Christ's name. Let's give the Lord a big hand of praise. Thank you, choir. Let's give a big hand. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Please, you may be seated. I welcome you to the second service here at the Shelter of Glory. If this is your first time joining us up on this mountain, we are the Glory Nation. 
and we worship Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord forever. We proclaim that we are the redeemed of the Lord. He has redeemed us with his precious blood. We are the saints of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We believe God that your time here this morning will be an encounter with the same God that has encountered many on this mountain. Changed their lives. Somebody testified this morning and said once upon a time, I asked God for just a 50 by 100 so that I can build my house. I asked God for a 50 by 100 so that I can build. He said, but as I speak to you now, of course he has built. There's no month I don't buy a land. Talk about God answering a prayer. But because the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worked in us. That's the fulfillment of that scripture. He asked God for a 50 by 100. He said he has 15 plots now. 50 by 100, 15 plots. This, this, they, sound, they, they sound alike, but they are not alike at all. I prefer the 15 actually to the 50 by 100. I know some of you, because of humility, you are okay with the 50 by 100. I like the God that answer him to answer me. Amen. I like that extra. It is by the extra that you can become a blessing. Is that not it? It's not enough for us to be blessed. No, 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 no. That's not how this covenant works. Being blessed is phase one. There's a part two. You becoming a blessing. In other words, you don't just have, but you have reached a point where you can now give what you have, and yet you are not going down. The 50 by 100 that he asked God for, some years ago he can give it to somebody now without thinking about it that is the covenant you blessed until you become a blessing hallelujah that's the covenant of Abraham that's what we are inside and we must learn how to make demands on it we are not just here to survive we are here to change the world those of you that were in the first service you heard me say that. We're not here to just survive. We're here to change the world. God will bless us. It will reach the ends of the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now we'll read a couple of scriptures. Um, so that I'll see how I can tie some things together for you. I started a conversation that may take a couple of services. Um, like I already said in the first service. I started a conversation that I tied to flame keepers. Flame Keepers. For those who are making note, that's the title. Flame Keepers. And um, like I said, it's a conversation that will take a while. I don't know how long it will take, uh, depending on how I feel it in my spirit. We are in our month of fresh fire. And I, I, I have said repeatedly that any time that God begins to make consecrational demands. Let me use that phrase. I don't know whether it's good English or not. Anytime God begins to make consecrational demands, it is only because he has a supernatural shift in mind. If you read the book of Joshua, you will hear Joshua make a statement to this effect, I'll paraphrase. He says, sanctify yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I think something to that effect in the book of Joshua. God had wonders in mind when he summoned Israel for consecration. So between them and the wonders that God is about to birth amongst them, there is a demand for consecration. This is a pattern. It is a pattern with God. 
that when he begins to give you spiritual appetites, I, I would like to use words that we may be familiar with. When God begins to give you spiritual appetites, you notice your spiritual taste board is being adjusted and fine-tuned. Like I was saying in the first service, you, you notice that you are no longer comfortable with certain things that may not necessarily be seen full, but they are taking the reasonable amount of your life time away. Like television shows, certain relationships, you, nobody hurts you, nobody offended you. The show is, has not become wrong yet. But you suddenly come to a point where you begin to tell yourself, you are wasting too much time watching this program anyways. What's the benefit? Those are what we call summons. Part of it that I didn't say in the first service is, you begin to notice your appetite start changing. You start thirsting or yearning for things that are a bit of the spiritual kind. Suddenly you want to pray more. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't know if it happened to anybody. You want to just be alone with God. You want to, you, 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 you want to just open the Bible and just read. Or you want to, you, you begin to get those, those, those shifts in your appetite. All of those are spiritual summons. They are demands of consecration. Now, I'm saying that to say this. Anytime you come to those seasons in your life, the ball is in your court. A shift can happen. If you honor those summons, whatever they may be, if you honor those summons, a shift will definitely happen. But for the most part, some believers are not trained to know those things. You didn't know that those times where suddenly you became uncomfortable with the amount of time you spend on social media. And you tell yourself, Kai, I'm spending too much time. Let me even shut this thing down. Or you became uncomfortable with the amount of time you spent speaking with somebody on the phone. You keep talking and talking rubbish that makes no sense. Nobody going anywhere. Sometimes we even call those things relationship. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then you just became uncomfortable with it and you want to shut down your phone. If you are born again, it is spirit that is summoning you like that. A spirit is trying to get your attention. Your appetite starts, suddenly you began to develop an unusual desire to want to hear the word of God. Or read the Bible or go away and pray. Even if you cannot pray, but you just feel like. You may even get away, but you don't even know what to pray. Those are summons. Those who learn how to tend to those things. They normally break into a supernatural shift. How many understood what I just said now in the last few minutes? I pray you do. Because it makes a lot of sense to understand that. If not, you'll be stagnated spiritually. If not, you'll miss divine visitations. You'll miss the move of God. Consecrational demands is a setup for a supernatural shift. It's a setup. Those who respond to them, they often cross over. And you know that this life... You are supposed to be crossing layers upon layers upon layers upon layers of glory. That's why the Bible says we go from glory to glory. If not, you become stagnated. And it's a dangerous thing to be stagnated. In the month of June, we came into that kind of season. There was that nudging. I came to church and I pushed it on you and I called everybody to a time of consecration. This month is not any different. It just isolated one of the components of the demands of this consecration, of this summons, which is the maintenance of the fire of the Lord. In the book of Leviticus, if you read chapter 6, I'll read maybe two or three scriptures so that I can just quickly move these things together. In Leviticus chapter 6, from verse 12 to 13, that was when the pattern was set. This is a pattern. What you're about to read here is a pattern. This is one of the principles, the governing principles of the kingdom of heaven. It happened. This is the shadow of it. The reality is in Christ. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. 
It shall not be put out and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. Maybe in the course of the month I'll talk about those items as well. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Now give me Proverbs 20, 27. Let me add that as well. Proverbs 20, 27. <coughs> Thank you. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. I want you to read it together with me. One, two, go. The spirit of a man is the candle. Of course, if you read that candle in different translation, you may get different things. All he's just emphasizing is there's a light of the spirit in every man. There's a fire in the spirit of man. Are you with me still? Huh? Are you sure? Some of you are not agreeing. You're making it look like I'm disturbing you. Are you with me still? Give me one more scripture. Let's bring it now all the way to the New Testament. Romans chapter 12. Give me verse 11. Romans chapter 12. I think I may need to read this in other translations. I just want the scriptures to speak for themselves. Romans 12 and 11. Thank you. All right. King James. Let's read King James first. It says, not slothful. What? In business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Okay. Let me take the liberty to read one or two translations. Let me start with the Amplified Translation. The Amplified Translation of that same verse of Scripture, Romans 12 and 11 says, Never lag in zeal and interest, oh, sorry, and in the earnest endeavor. Be aglow and burning with the Spirit serving the Lord. Let me look at your neighbor and then be aglow and burning. Turn to another person. That person didn't like the way you said it to him or her. Turn to the other person. Be a glow and burning. Look at the third person. Tell them, be a glow and burning. First things first. This is not an advice. This is the law of a new creature. This is the same thing that was stated in the Old Testament. The fire must never go out in the temple. Now, in the New Testament, the temple is not a building. The temple is the believer. That's why the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same thing. That's why I told you when I read Leviticus, that is a pattern. It's a pattern. If there is a temple of God, there must be a fire in that temple. And that fire must never go out. Be a glow and burning is a command. Let me check other translations. Maybe we'll get something else. The Message Bible. The Message Bible translate the same Romans 12 and verse 11. L listen to the translation here. The Message Bible says, don't burn out. Ooh, I like this. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, don't burn out. You know, burn out now. Burn finish. Never burn finish. <laughs> you know, some people are burnt out already. A few years ago, they were on fire for Jesus. Today, they are telling people on fire to calm down. Calm down. You just came to church. That's why. Who can relate? Okay, now, the person that told you that is not in church. Has anybody ever gotten such a vibe from an old Christian before? Eh? Is it true? Has anybody in church, you met in church, told you, oh boy, relax. It's your own too much. We don't they run this thing. <laughs> that is someone that has burnt out. May you never burn out. I 
actually expected a lot of amen than that. Are you not scared that the Bible said the fire should never go out? And yet there are people whose fires are going out. Wouldn't you want to know why he said the fire should not go out? Are you okay with it? There are Christians who are now wet blankets in the church. When they come to church, they come with this. You know when Dr. Alid was here, he described one, one, one organ like that in their church. I'm not sure in the conference, the, the convention. One organ that used to come to church like this, organ. Eh? He used to come to church like this. He's a leader in the church. Leader. Leader. There are some leaders, but may the Lord sack them. He will come to church like this and come and occupy leader seats, cross leg. When people are shouting and praising God, he's waving hand like this. May you never grow to that demonic leadership. I say, may you never grow to that Jezebel leadership. Say amen so that the devil will leave you alone. <laughs> Let's finish the, the, the is it message translation we're reading, right? Message. So message says, don't burn out. He said, keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master. Because of time, I won't read. I was going to read NIV and the other translations, but it's okay. This too is good enough. You understand what it means. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is what King James told us in those days that we didn't get. That he said, be fervent in spirit. He's only telling you, keep your fire burning. In the Old Testament, the priest had a responsibility. And that responsibility said, the fire must never go out. In every house of God, there is a flame. And the believer who is the priest of God in the New Testament is the flame keeper. You are the keeper of your own flame. Nobody is responsible for your flame. If your flame dies, you are to blame. You are your own flame keeper. There's a fire that must be burning. If not, you are susceptible to certain things. I went in a direction in the first service that I'm trying not to go back there. Because a lot of Christians need to understand something. If you Now, please get the message of the first service. Because what I'm doing is like writing a book and these are chapters. You have to understand the whole book before you make conclusions. But first things first, you must understand the same way there was a temple in the Old Testament, there is still a temple today. And within this, the walls of this sanctuary this morning, there are many temples. You are one of them. I am one of them. What used to be a building has now become a person. And that person is you and me. The same way God expected the temple of old to always have flames burning on the altar. There's a spirit in you that is a candle that must always keep burning. And it is the priesthood responsibility to keep the flames of your spirit. Child of God, there are things that cannot happen to a man whose spirit is on fire. There are things that cannot hide in the life of a man who is burning. Some things that are comfortable with you are only comfortable because it's conducive. There's something about the burning, even if it's just the heat of the flames, that is able to keep certain things at bay. When Paul found himself in the island of Malta, the King James called it Melita. A serpent fastened itself on his hand. That serpent could only stay until a fire appears. There are some serpents that are hanging to people's life because there's no fire. Fire will always send the serpent away. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? I am saying that the 
there's a flame in your spirit that you have a duty to keep for which if you don't, you will lose it. It can burn out. The story is told of ten virgins. Once upon a time they had trimmed lamps that were burning and the lights were there. Until one day they ran out of oil. They ran out of oil, sorry. And the fire died. And Jesus called them foolish virgins. They were virgins. But because they had no fire. They were called foolish by the master. It is foolishness. Therefore to be a fireless Christian. The question to ask yourself today. Is the fire of your spirit still burning? Because if it's burning we will know. And the first way to know that is to identify a basic simplistic description of what this fire is. That's what I intend to do in this chapter 2. I want to help us identify the fire. It's not abstract. It's not something you cannot know. When is there and when is not there? No, it's too serious for it to be a guesswork. It's something you can know. The fire of the spirit has vivid scriptural descriptions and what they are. And it cannot be mistaken for anything less. The end of this message is to bring us to a point where we can examine ourselves. Am I still burning or have burnt out? Am I still burning or have burnt out? It's a danger not to be on fire. You become an easy target. The only stove that a fly can be comfortable to perch on is a stove that has not been on for a while. If you go to your kitchen today and you have these stubborn flies around your house, they want to come and perch anywhere there's semblance of food and they can perch on your gas burners as long as you have not powered the gas. But the moment you power the gas, even if that fly was trained in Afghanistan and licensed by the Wagner Group in Russia, it will move away very quickly. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. It will move away very quickly. Because it does not need any instruction. The heat is a communication. There's a heat that you need to be generating. The prophet said, I went in the heat of my spirit. It is possible for your spirit to be bringing forth heat. When you are bringing forth that heat, you don't need to introduce yourself. You are self-introduced. The fire introduces itself. The fire of the Spirit of God burning within the spirit of a believer. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water. I think that should be John chapter 5, right? He said, but there's one that is coming that is mightier than I. Who, the, who shoe latchet? I'm not able to untie. He said, that one, that one. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. We know the Holy Ghost, especially Pentecostals. When we speak in tongues, I have the Holy Ghost. Where is the fire? If the Holy Ghost alone was enough, he wouldn't talk about the fire. No wonder on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together in one place with one accord. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and sat upon each of them and, uh, 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 and filled the room where they were seated. Verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and sat upon each of them. Everybody had their own fire. Let me ask your neighbor, where is your fire? This one that you are going around trying to quench the fire of other people. Where is your fire? Where is your fire? Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the Old Testament, they had a literal physical burning. In the New Testament, it comes through in diverse expressions. And it's important for us to know. I want to mention very quickly four descriptions of what this fire is. What this fire, this fire is. Thank you, Jesus. The more I talk about this, the more you are going to feel the fire of God around you. Hallelujah. So be sensitive. Amen. Because somebody may need to be kindled afresh. Somebody may need to be kindled today. In Revelation chapter 2, if you look at verse 4, it was the letters of Jesus to uh, the churches. This should be the church in Laodicea. He made a judgment over them. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. This is Jesus speaking to a church, body of believers. He said, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will do what? Your light will be no more. I will take it out of its place except thou repent. The word repent is two words, re, which means again. Pent, which means top. Come again to the top. What was he talking about top? If you read verse 4, he said, you have left your first love. It means that your fire is qualified to die now. Oh God. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Okay, does it make sense? It's one thing for, for you to hear, it's another thing for you to make sense. Does it make sense? If it makes sense to you, say it makes sense. Lift your hand, let me be sure it makes sense to you. Does it make sense? Let's describe the fire in four descriptions. Number one, to be on fire is to possess a burning love for the master. To possess a burning love for the master. Hmm. Holy Spirit, help me. My heart is indicting many matters. To possess a burning love for the master. Every word were chosen deliberately. Let me ask a question. Maybe this might help so that I won't talk too much. This week is 700 naira now. The longer you stay in church, <laughs> the more the bills you pay. How many of you know this week is 700 naira? Okay, this is 700 naira. Very bad. Eh? It's, it's an ungodly thing because it will take more than 100,000 naira to buy diesel for one service in shelter of glory. Yeah. So let's move quickly. The question is this. The Lord will provide. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Are you Alana? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you for the encouragement. The Lord will provide. Amen. Like he always will do. Amen. All right, so let's talk. If you ever genuinely got born again, I'll tell you something. If you ever, because we must come to a point where we separate between who joined the church and who got born again. Because of Pentecostalism and the prevalence of um, what we do, it's so easy for people who just joined a church to just begin to call themselves born again without a born again experience. Yes, very easy. 
There are many people today in Pentecostal church that have never, you can't ask them, when did you give your life to Christ? And they'll tell you. They just joined a church. And if they are good performers, they'll just adopt the ways of the church. Maybe they start dressing like that church, learn the language, which may be scriptural language, and then before you know it, they blend in so perfectly. But they have never had a salvation experience. But let me describe something. It may help somebody here. When you first got born again, there was this love that you had for God. It was intoxicating. I'm going to add that experience. Your, your life was just, you, you just wish everything was about God. You love God so much. How many experienced that in your lifetime? If you have never experienced that, where you are so in love with God, the way, if you have never fallen in love with a human being, the feeling is the same. You are so in love with God, you can't even explain it. He becomes your obsession. Your whole life was affected. It's an emotional thing, I'm telling you. You are emotional about God. And when that love existed, there was a way you treated God. And there was a way you, did, you dealt with the issues and matters that has to do with God. Am I correct? If you have never had that experience, I am only giving you a diagnosis. You have never been born again. You may have gone through the rank of church and even become a pastor. But you have never been born again. There is something called first love. People who are married, they can relate to what I'm going to say now. Think about when you were in your courtship. I'm not talking about those who are doing boyfriend and girlfriend without destination. You know, there's boyfriend and girlfriend without destination. But there are people who are in courtship. They got into something serious. They started looking forward to a future together. Some of us here have been there before, right? You started looking forward to a, a future together with the person. You fell in love with the, another person, with a human being. And it was love. You had some feelings that went with that love. Am I correct? There were emotions that went with that love. There were things, that is the time that they say love is blind. Where you will never see anything wrong. If the person insults you, you will smile. <laughs> because at that time, eh, love covered multitude of sin. I wanted to paint it graphically. That's when no amount of time spent together was enough. And no amount of money spent on each other was too much. How many of you still remember? And no amount of effort made for the person you love that was too much. If you have to trek from Kansho to North Bank by 10 p.m. in the night, it will just be like from the altar to the back entrance there. Anything for my love. Some of you that are sitting there pretending you don't know what I'm talking about. But you got married. You have a problem. You probably marry somebody you don't love. There is something called a first love. And it's not love at first sight. Because this is more than love at first sight. It carried you for a long time. It took you to the wedding. Passed you through the wedding. For some people, even went through the first year. Even though there was much more trouble. But it is still there. Then after a while, the thing will begin to... Uh, 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 uh. In the first love, there was no effort to love. It was effortless. 
You were kind without proper upbringing. You were polite without a nature of politeness. Hello, my dear. <laughs> you look beautiful today. He's the same person you are married to now. We can't remember the last time he said, you look beautiful today. <laughs> Yet nothing has changed. The same person, same name, same complexion. Well, maybe complexion has changed. I don't understand. But whatever. We can't remember the last time. Am I driving the point? Yes, sir. Should we keep talking? Yes, sir. Somebody say first love. If you ever genuinely got born again, you will know the meaning of first love. You know. If you don't know this thing, it's like the relationship between a boy and a girl. You don't even time your prayer with God. You just go and start talking to God. You just talk. You want to read his word. You want to sing and worship him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, it's called first love. It's called first love. It's a burning love. It's a love that is, is latent and loaded with all kinds of emotions. It carries with it a passion that the Bible says many waters cannot quench love. When you used to lie to yourself that you like that girl from your primary school or secondary school, remember what risk you took. They had a wicked dog. Her father was a bully in the neighborhood. You still have the infantry to put your head across the fence. Chichi. 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 You say it's small, small so that the dog will not hear. And so that the father will not hear. You are hanging on the fence, broken bottles on the fence. She, she is me. It's Andy. It's Andy. Your love. All you needed at that time is for the dog to say, Hua! You will tumble from there, break your leg, and come back tomorrow. First love. First love. You will come back tomorrow. Rain is falling, no. Rain is not falling, no. If you have an appointment with Chichi, you are gone. You would rather carry your suede in your hand. Put it inside later. Walk barefooted, get beaten by rain, rush into the restaurant bathroom, tidy up, wear your suede back, just because Chichi will be there in the next 10 minutes. You send Chichi transport money to take taxi. Okada brought you. Because the only thing that matters to you is the love of the one you love. First love is a burning love. You used to make a man. One day, I was to join a wedding many years ago. Many, many years ago. This thing should be like, it should be like 22 years ago. I was to join a wedding. Eh? So in the course of the the whole event. It's not like today that everything is organized in church. Some discoveries were made about the girl and the status of her health that the family of the boy were not comfortable with. But it was discovered too late, particularly on the wedding day. So the family said they don't want. And the thing became an argument. The service was up and running. We were in my office arguing. 22 years ago, we were in the office arguing. And then the boy told us, the parents now, I uh, happen to be there. He said, I want to tell you people one thing. <laughs> if by 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, this time we are past the 10, if by 11 o'clock I am not joined in matrimony to this woman, he said, I give you two hours, I will kill myself. I say, see love. It was at that point that the parents said, hey, Pastor. Pastor. 
Pastor. Pastor. Please. Whatever he wants. That's, that's first love. I hear what I'm saying. It exists between every genuine born again Christian and God. It's just that it can be lost. It can be lost. The church that we read about lost it. And Jesus said the consequence of that is that your light will go out. Your candle will be removed. You will not, there's nothing will be there. That's the consequence. So this fire is first a burning love for the Lord. The question this morning, are you still in love with the master? I'm not saying, do you still need the help of God? I asked the question correctly. Do you still love God? Or it is now lip service more than you know yourself. You know where you were. You know when God was truly important. And you know also when he became a means to an end. He's the only one that can work miracle. Everybody need God does not mean everybody love God. And if your relationship with God is not powered by love, there's no fire in your spirit. No fire. You don't have spiritual fire. How many heard the statement I just made? If your relationship with God, you're going to church and everything, is not powered by a genuine love, you can like a church and not love God. And that will make you a committed member of that church. I don't want to talk too much on this thing. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You can like the setup of a church, but you don't love God. You will go to that church till you die, but you have never loved God. It appeals to your senses. This is the kind of church I like. See vibe. It's one thing to like a church. It's another thing to be in love with God. To be in love with God. When you fall in love, you want to do everything to please the one you love. Am I correct? Especially when it is for still first love. You want to do anything. Anything that will offend the one you love, especially if it's still first love, you want to avoid it. Many, like the Laodicean church, listening to me today, both here and online, many believers have lost their first love. The implication of that is that the fire in your spirit it's going down. You may not have noticed, but the devil has noticed. He knows. He's looking at you. He's just watching you. He knows that you are no longer a threat to the serpent. He's just looking for opportunity to just wrap himself around you now. You're no longer a threat. No fire. The only thing a snake fears is a burning fire. He doesn't dare flames. He's afraid of fire. If they tell you snake, enter a house, set the house on fire and see. You won't look for the snake. The snake will look for the way out. That's why Paul threw that snake into the fire. Fire is the nemesis of serpent. You carry fire, the devil will fear you. Do you still have a burning love for the master? Or he has become something you use. You just use him. Anytime there are challenges in your life, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, you kneel at the altar 20 times. But in your heart of heart, you have grown cold toward God. Cold, cold, cold. It will be easy to begin to go back to the scene you used to enjoy before. But you left because you fell in love with God. You start going back to those things. You start explaining it. After all, I still go to church. After all, I'm still an usher. After all, I still sing in the choir. But you have gone. You are falling from your former height. Because the love of God has grown cold in your heart. Anytime you check your heart and you speak to yourself and what you feel for God is not burning love, you have lost fire. You have lost fire. I don't care what they think about you in your church. I don't care what your friends think about you. 
you have lost fire. Once it's not first love, there's no fire in that soul. The fire is gone. And when the fire is gone, the serpent is happy because now he can come in. It's a burning love for the Lord. Do you still have it? Is it still there? Can you feel it? Do you know it? Praise God. Anybody that makes sense out of what I just said, say praise the Lord. God knows the aim of this message is not to condemn anybody or set a pedestal for another. To make it look like this person is perfect in it and you are not. No. This is too serious to be used for a show. He said you have left your first love. See your candle will be removed. That's the master talking. What a life lived in darkness. No light. No light. Where is your fire? Where is your fire? Where is your first love for God? When you were in love with God, nothing anybody did in church that discouraged you from coming to church. When you fell out of love with God, all you just need to do is be entering church and see the face of the usher and he didn't smile for you and you didn't find out whether the usher is going through problem, emotional crisis. You just conclude that they are not respecting you in this church. And you tell yourself, this is my last Sunday. If I come here again, make I bend. Are you with me? Is that not how we talk, we talk it in Nigeria? Because there's no love for God. No love. No love. It has dried up and it is your duty to refuel it. Nobody can do it for you. You fall in love again. Jesus said you can return to your first love. You can return. It must not stay that way. You can get to that place where you are passionate about God again. Where it is about you and God. Not about you and the church or you and the pastor. It's about you and God. Plus church minus church plus pastor minus pastor. Your passion is still consistent. Because you love God. Because you love God. Is there still love in your heart? Is there still a burning? If you follow this line of thought, the second is like unto it. It is called being zealous for the Lord. Being zealous. There's something called zeal. In the Bible, zeal is a consuming force. It's a consuming force. That word consume is used often of flames. Am I correct? It's a consuming force. Some translations say the zeal of your house has consumed me. We used to sing a song when I got born again. Back in the early 90s. The zeal of God has consumed me. It burns in my soul. How many of you remember that song? Okay. I don't tell. <laughs> Ooh. We used to sing it. We, it meant so much to us. The zeal of God has come to me. It burns in my soul. It was so, it was so real to us. It was real. There's something called the consuming zeal of God. Zeal. Zeal. It's an indication of fire, the presence of fire. Zeal. is to be zealous for the Lord. What does it mean to be zealous for the Lord? In everyday English, simplistic interpretation. To be zealous for the Lord means to possess an urgency in your heart toward God. To possess an urgency in your heart toward God. To possess an urgency. To possess an urgency. When it comes to God, you are urgent. You are urgent. You are urgent. You will suspend anything to face God first. 
to possess an urgency for God. Urgency. Some of us have lost our urgency many years ago. It was only the first year we came to church. We were all out for God. If they say evangelism, we were there. If they say let's clean the church, you made appointment with it. If they say let's do this, you were everywhere. But right now, you have excuse for everything. And all your excuses are genuine. You lost your zeal. All your excuses are genuine. Remember I said they are genuine. But I say that sarcastically. Deliberately. Because genuine is relative. Hello? You are the one that choose what you call genuine. You choose it for yourself. All your excuses are genuine. Because it is in the nature of man to do anything he really wants to do and excuse anything he really doesn't want to do. It's in the nature of man. It's in the nature of man. Every one of us possesses that ability and capacity. We do what we want to do and we excuse what we really don't want to do. And our excuse will be genuine. But the only way you will know that all your excuse, that as genuine as it is, holds no water, is when you now take the same circumstances and just oppose it into another context. Can I give you an example of this statement I just made now? Rainfall. Rainfall on Sunday morning and rainfall on Monday morning will provoke different response from you. Do I need to interpret that? Let me say it again. Sundays are most at church going days, right? Rainfall on Sunday morning, the same you, same environment, same community, different context. Rainfall has different interpretation. On Sunday morning, rainfall means I can't go out again. Let me just relax. After all, there is church next Sunday. On Monday morning, rainfall. Any devil that wants them to sack me, thunder will fire you. We will go through this thing together. Same rainfall, same individual. Different response in different contexts. That's why what we call genuine is relative. In, in, when we talk about excuses. When you possess an urgency for the Lord, it will minimize your excuse. When you don't have urgency for God, you will be multiplying your excuse every week. I can't come today because we are very busy in our office. In fact, we are this, this. Uh, we are going here. We are doing this. I, I cannot pray today. You know, they say we should arrive in the office early. If they say you should arrive in the office by 7 a.m., what kept you on your bed till 6 a.m.? That's why you cannot pray. Because they come to the office by 7. Or oh God, you don't have urgency about God. If you have urgency about God, you will know that that day is an exceptional day. And four hours of sleep would have been enough. Why didn't you wake up by 4 and pray? But because God is no longer urgent, he can wait. Lord, when I return from office, I'll pray two hours. Don't worry. You come back from office, you are tired. You gave him the worst of you. You gave your office the best of you. You were everywhere. Before your boss asked the question, you have the answer. When you enter prayer now, Lord, well done, no. Oh. Ooh, Kai. Lord, you understand. See how my body is paining me. You know now. Let me just take a little nap. Lord, I'll see you later. You have been saying that for seven months because you're no longer urgent. There was a time you were urgent. When they say soul winning, you were urgent. When they say prayer, you were urgent. Bible had a place in your life. Where is your urgency today? You have lost your first love. The zeal for God in your heart died. The zeal of his house is no longer... Your business is more important than God. In fact, you are using God to support your business. Like the way people go to native doctor in those days. Using charm to support their business. Many people today in the body of Christ, especially in Africa, they are only using God to support their business. So that the thing will work. So that they can be bigger. So that they can show God more. That's why any time there's a crisis in your life, God becomes a priority. Anytime there's competition around your business, God becomes a priority. Anytime there's a threat to your existence, God becomes a priority. You are using God to support 
your life. That's not the, that's not the God of the Bible. He doesn't know that operation. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Other areas of your life, God is an option. He's an option. He's an option. When you choose your friends, God is an option. When you spend your money, God is an option. When you keep companies, God is an option. Are we together still? Does it make sense this morning? In case you are getting angry and I'm saying this, in me too, I'm getting angry and I'm saying it too. Let's share the anger. Praise God. To possess an urgency. Are you still urgent about God? David said, I was glad when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord. Every day you are getting angry in church. I was not in church. Nobody called me. Nobody called me. You are getting angry. What about those who were glad just because it's service day? When last were you glad just because it's service day? You were glad. Not that you dragged yourself out of bed with all manner of murmurings against God and against his humble servant. That's how I will go to church now. Papa will go and be shouting. Hallelujah. As I'm going like this, if you just shout smile, God, I'll just go back. Hey! You lost your zeal, sir. It's not the fault of Papa. It's your problem. Because once upon a time, you didn't need any follow-up. You didn't need anybody to, to visit you. You were the one visiting other people that were not in church. Now you are the one looking for visit. You now become an entitlement. Since I came to this church, Papa has never visited me. Well done. Do you know the visit, Papa? The Bible says, let us love one another. It needs to let Papa love you. One another. Reciprocity. Let's share it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. When people lose urgency for God, they will from excuses. So when you have too much excuse about the things of God, this is your problem. Your fire has gone down. You lost urgency. Is that okay so far? All right. The, the last two I'll just mention, write it down. I'll deal with it another day because there's no more time uh, to deal with that. Number three. Is it number three? Number three is, write it down. It may sound very simple and basic. Write it down. It's still, it's still it's, it's, it's something. The fear of the Lord. The Amplified calls it the reverential fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. There's something, it is not a fear of, you are afraid of a terrorist. This is reverence. There are people who don't have reverence for God. They don't, they lost it. They used to, but they lost it. They lost it. They can easily, I mean, they can wave God and his principles. They just wave it. They just wave it. What they cannot do elsewhere. When they begin to lose the, the fire of God in their heart, they will do it to God and it doesn't mean anything to them. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. The Christian that can never go late to work, that can come late to church, does not fear God. He only needs God. Should I say that again? Again, it's the principle of same situation, different context. So it becomes relative. The Christian that will not, that will open their shop consistently every day by 8 o'clock. Rainfall, sunshine, their shop was open by 8 o'clock. Riot or no riot, shop was open. But comes late to church, his problem is the fear of God. He does not reverence God doesn't reverence God. The Christian that can keep appointment with man but can't keep appointment with God has lost the fear of God. The fear of God is what is missing and that's fire. That's fire. That's inner flames. Once you lose the fear of God, you have no fire on your candle. If nobody will tell you, I'll tell you straight. Examine yourself. Just examine yourself. Examine yourself. 
Every time you prioritize against God is the lack of the fear of God. There are Christians, they have never missed their contribution. You know this contribution they do in Benway, you know all over Benway. Offices, they do, why are you looking at me like that? You think I don't know these things? Contribution. How many of you know contribution? Otata J. How many of you know contribution? Uh -huh. uh, uh, bam. Uh -huh. Bam. Adashi. Uh, you know it. Kai. You see, I like to make things practical. So when I ask something you know, you should not pretend you don't know. How many of you know Adashi? Okay. How many of you know Bam? How many of you know contribution? Okay. How many of you know Tata J? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm preaching good, though. How many of you know these things I'm talking about? Now, that's one of the ways in Sub Saharan Africa people used to support their businesses. So it's very effective, it's working. Of course, in some instances, hallelujah, you know now. Some people used to praise the Lord. But those things work. Some people have used it to build a business. Very effective. Community, you know, self-help. Very powerful thing. Now, let me say this. Help me. Let me say this. There are Christians, they have never, since they joined Contribution five years ago, they have never missed their monthly appointment for Contribution before. If their child like, let her be driven from school. They will sort out that contribution first. The child will stay at home and wait. When they get money, they will go back to school. You know what I'm talking about. If you like, don't nod your head. I know you know. I know you know. That same Christian, within the same five-year period, have never been consistent in paying their tithe every month. Where is the problem? The fear of God. The fear of God. He loves his life more than God. The fear of God. That's the only problem. Because all is economic. All has to do with money. God can be easily excused. Even their child school fees, contribution can stop it. Can delay it, at least. Delay. But their tithe, God, their offering, I like the way everywhere is quiet. <laughs>